uh, manage stuff. So if you've not been here before, Open Data Saves Lives um, started six weeks ago. It's all on one web page, so you can find out about that. We wrote about it. There's some notes there that um, people have put their use cases in if you're looking to identify work or needs to be done. There's some um, uh, great input there. Please do have a look at that. And then there's also, if there's a calls for help, um, specific requests, please put them there and we'll try and help people uh, connect with the right people to get the stuff that needs to be done, done. So please have a look at that. You can watch the previous sessions there. We've talked about the data page, which is developing really nicely. And then there's a whole load of resources that um, ourselves and others have put together um, on what is happening around COVID and COVID data. Okay, so I'm now gonna go to the agenda. Hopefully, Sarah Overton, and I can see that. If you give us a wave, Sarah. <clears throat> if you take yourself off mute, Okay. And you want to share your screen? Yeah, no, I've got a presentation, so hopefully this will all, all work. Um, so bear with me. Right, okay. Oh, interesting. Right, so does I just go, all right, share basic. I'm <laughs> trying to work out. Okay, is this going to work? Let me just try and see if that will. So you just go onto basic, do you? And then just pick up the file that you can see. It's not sharing all my, um, it's not sharing all my screens, unfortunately. It's, can you, um, hang on, let's try again. Oh, I thought this would be easy. I haven't used Zoom to share things before. Okay. Let Sarah, me just... if you just, if you open the window, you just click on, share screen pick the window you want to share with the, the rest of us yeah it's not actually showing my um it's not actually showing my powerpoint that i've got open it's just um coming up with excel worksheets uh, and um outlook okay let me just um sorry guys this isn't really helpful is it let me just close down everything um and then hopefully if i close down everything and the only thing i've got left open i did i did actually have a rationalization of my desktop before this but anyway um, Let's not all share our uh, crazy desktops. Um, I know. Yeah, we can have a things. sharing session about how, how untidy we are on our desktops. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try and do that. I'm going to try and start talking and um, just try and keep it interesting for people. Yeah. Although I'm not desperately good at multitasking. Um, so essentially, in Kent and Medway, um, we've been putting together a um, a model hang on let's just see if i can just do this now otherwise i might just give up actually mark are you online can i share my presentation with you and then can you share it on your desktop that might be a good way uh, i'll have a try i'll have a try if you ping it across on email is it stuff i've already got no okay no. and then at least you can be trying to share that while i'm talking um, okay yeah, my ability to multitask on limited sleep is a bit difficult. Okay, so um, so just sending that over to Mark now. Um, but essentially, in Kenson Medway, we've um, picked up the um, imperial modelling, and we've uh, taken all the sort of national assumptions, if you like, and created a, a, a system model which then um, applies that to the uh, local population. And we've done that in a very collaborative way across our um, across our um, CCGs and provider and social care um, colleagues. So, so it's quite a joint effort. Um, and really what that is allowing us to do is rather than relying on um, some of the national modelling, which um, is done at, at very much the national level, and then you get your local cut of that picture um, on a population by head basis, it has actually allowed us to have a a more granular view of how um, things are playing out locally as you'll see as I go through the presentation um, and the way that we're using that is we're producing twice weekly reports on um, how we feel the virus is progressing um, within the um, within Kent and Medway in each of the four different what we call ICPs so we've got Kent which I'm sure some of you are familiar with but just in case you're not and we've got Dartford Graysham as well Medway um, sorry Dartford Graysham and Swanley 
um, Midway and Swell, East Kent and West Kent. Um, and so it just allows us to be thinking about what's going on at that level as well as at the Kent and Medway level. And what we're doing is we're taking that modelling and we're looking at the actuals which are coming out every day through our sit reps. Um, so those snapshots in time of what's actually happening in our hospitals, in our community services, our GPs, etc. And we're feeding that into uh, the modelling on what we're calling a now casting process, um, which I think some of you are probably also familiar with, which we're not we're not changing the trends, we're not doing trend analysis, but what we're using it to do is to go back and assess our assumptions um, and making sure they're correct. And what we're rapidly finding is actually that we could almost do with four different models for each of the different ICPs, um, which I will show you shortly. Um, so, um, Mark, any luck? No, maybe not. Um, Sorry, Sarah. I because I'm on an iPad because I can't get my laptop. Paul, I've sent you the slides, which <laughs> we'll we won't forward any further. Um, but I'm hoping Paul, you'll be able to do it. Just because on an iPad you can't show your screen, and my laptop's just died. But <laughs> I think Paul will have them. So I, I've got them. Good lad. Thank you. Right, let's have a look at this. Good. I've just done the blurb at the beginning. Yes, so I'll start talking through um, the next slide anyway. You, there you go. That's Results. it. Thank you. So we can go to slide three, please. Thank you. So this is basically just showing that it's uh, oh four, uh, the one four. Um, so this diagram is just oh, for that. This di and the diagram that we'll go back to in a minute is just basically um, uh. showing that it's the SEER model. That we're we using, which is pretty. Oh, the one before that. Sorry, yeah, that's it. Um, which is pretty um, consistent with what other people are doing. Um, so, um, and and what we're doing is we're coming up with a number of um, cases um, that are being that we, we understand how many new cases we're getting into the system every day, and then we're reflecting that through into our GP services and what we anticipate that they will be experiencing on a day-by-day -day basis and then onwards into the hospital and then out of the hospital into our community services and then into our care homes and our death services. So it is very much a system model that's been built with our um, colleagues that we work very closely with the whole system partnership um, and we've been working with them for a number of years which has given us a good platform to be able to do this work around COVID-19. Um, so do you want to go to the next slide? Um, and what we're doing is we're not just applying the um, national assumptions to uh, the local population based on age. We're also looking at the risk profiling of the population, which we can do as a result of the work we've also done with WSP in the past to actually segment our population. And so you can see here the benefit of doing that, because when we look at discharges, we're obviously just not looking at the discharges as a sum coming out every day, but we're trying to actually understand um, those risk groups across um, by the um, experience that they've had in the hospital. So for example, um, we know that we will probably have to put a different discharge pathway together for somebody who's a high risk patient, who's been through IT, ITU, um, if indeed they have actually survived um, coming through ITU or if indeed they've actually been put through ITU in the first place. So it's, it's allowing us to have quite a granular view, if you like, of our population um, and um, what their needs are as they move, move through our health and care services. Um, next slide. Um, so this one I've just put in because um, when you're looking at health and care services, um, there's different um, aspects obviously that you're looking at and different, different types of provision. And um, we, I think as a system, we, we fell into the trap of talking about peaks quite early, and but we were actually talking about different peaks without realising it. So this was something I pulled together to, um, to uh, demonstrate that actually an emission in infection will be reflected through to um, emission, uh, a peak in emissions later on, which will then be reflected through a slightly later stage to emission in beds, um, to, sorry, to peaks in beds and then um, at a later stage to, um, to the deaths. So it was really just trying to help people understand that 
yeah, these different peaks come at, come at different times um, across our different services. Um, so next, next slide. This is a made up view, by the way, just to illustrate, we haven't had it that perfectly with all those peaks in that way um, through what we've been observing, but it was just to demonstrate the point to people that different peaks happen at different times. Now, um, I put this one, we put this one together because it effectively shows and begins to illustrate what I was saying earlier on that um, our different ICPs are um, experiencing about very slightly differently, but they are experiencing the virus differently. Um, and therefore that is having an impact on what we're seeing coming through in terms of demands on the health services. So you'll see from this slide that up in Dartford, closer proximity to London, um, and a slightly start earlier infection, first infection date on the 5th of February. And they've actually um, had a greater experience of the um, virus. So the light blue, um, if you can't read it on the slide, the light blue area is, um, is showing those that are still susceptible. So rather depressingly, that is still a large percentage of the population. Um, the dark blue is showing those who currently are symptomatic and infected. And um, sorry, that would be asymptomatic, the number of people infected. The very thin blue line that you can see is the deaths. Um, and then those in that the green areas, those that have come through it and recovered. Um, so um, you can see that the Darvers had it worse, and then East Kent and West Kent kind of had it less. And if you go on to the next slide, um, you can start to begin to see the variation in demand that, that actually puts onto the local system. Um, so this is, um, yeah, this is um, quite an internal piece of work, but I've wanted to share it with you um, because um, it um, it demonstrates quite nicely um, the very the variation that we're seeing in admissions across the ICPs, and um, there's a couple of points here that. Um, a, you can begin to see that there's lots of variation on every day, um, and that's why we put the, the red line is an average, um, a three-day average, to try and get some degree of smoothing. Um, and West Kent is almost dropping to zero and has one of the lowest level of prevalence in, in the county. But in East Kent, um, you can see there that um, it's not doing what we would expect it to be doing at the moment and hasn't been since about the middle of April. Now, there, have, there could be various reasons um, for, for that happening. And that's really why um, I, I wanted to sort of come on the call today and, and ask for a degree of help, um, because um, it's probably being driven by a couple of things. Um, one could be um, compliance level. Um, and so there are anecdotal reports of um, compliance not being as, as vigorous in East Kent as it perhaps it is um, by comparison in West Kent. Um, the other thing and that we're looking at is care homes and um, is it care home space is another, um, it, it, it's, a, it's not an element that obviously we control within health that we have a lot of insight into, um, but is playing a very large part as we all know in the virus and you can see that potentially in East Kent, how that 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 the, the impact on the local health services is, is is being driven by probably a large degree, and we're still investigating this about what's happening in our care homes. So, um, any any help um, that um, around understanding better of sort of um, our private care home provision, um, and also any help anyone has in terms of any movement data. Um, that we could be putting on. We did find some initial um, movement data, but it was dependent on um, mobile phone uh, coverage, and it was dependent on people signing up to actually being monitored. And it was very unclear as to how many people were actually um, signing up in each area. So from that, it looked like East Kent had a very high level of movement versus um, West Kent, which is more following a, na a national average, but we weren't particularly comfortable about sharing, um, about using that data because we just didn't know where it was coming from. So if anyone's got any insights into something that is more um, robust, then that would be really helpful. Um, 
just so you understand those graphs a little bit more, the um, you've, we've got three different um, compliance lines there. Um, one is the expected compliance line, which is the dark blue one, which expects a 65% compliance level amongst our lower risk population, which we've taken as being under the age of 70 with no comorbidities. Then our higher risk population is, and our moderate risk population, our moderates are those over 70 and or with one or more long-term conditions. And then our high is obviously those that are being shielded at the moment. And we've varied the level of compliance to get those two different the, the dot, two different dotted lines. And you can see the sensitivity of the modeling and um, to the compliance level. So having some help understanding what our local population is doing um, would, be, would be really helpful. So I don't know if anyone's got any questions on what the normal format is, but happy to happy to take any questions. Yeah, it's it's Paul here. Well, what we'll do is we'll um, uh, see if there's any questions in the chat. So if people got questions, I do know that um, uh, there was a a data set of care homes released yesterday, made open. So I think um, Geolytics, who are a uh, geographic uh, consultancy, digital um, company have, um, I think it's great open street map or Google and they create a data set of all uh, care homes in the UK and put it on a map. So we'll put you in touch with that. So I think that might help just for an initial view of where the care homes are and each one of them, which might help um, with some geographic um, spread of that. And then there is a lot of um, um, requests at the moment from people who are making it to lots of people about um, what is going on and what's going to happen next in terms of people movement, um, lockdown, um, compliance, and that sort of thing. So I think what we'll do is we'll put this request in the um, help bucket, and then we'll ask the network on here to start helping, um, because you will not be the only place in the country who is trying to wrestle with that um, uh, those variables. So are there any other questions for Sarah before we um, move on? Uh, there are some questions in the chat, um, yeah. so um, I'm happy to either read them out on behalf or just um, signpost. Uh, so we've got a question from Stephen Blackburn from Karen Hodgson, uh, and also from uh, Peter Wells as well. Okay, if you want to, uh, Steve, go first, and then um, Amy, you could get the people uh, to ask their questions. So Peter, over to you. And hi, that was a really good presentation. Thank you very much. It's really, yeah, it's great work. The so one of the things I've been doing in my own work at a national level, I've been looking at the dashboards NHSX have been working on with various private sector companies. Have they been helpful to Kent at all? Has that work been helpful to Kent or has your work been inputting into the centre? I'm curious on that panel. Um. Thanks for the comments about the presentation. I'm absolutely shattered, actually. I've been <laughs> I've had a lot of sleep, so um, I'm yeah, I'm not presenting my usual, uh, you know, sort of articulate way. But anyway, um, so um, so are we're using the COVID nineteen dashboard information? Um, when we um, we kind of we're part of the data and analytics and huddle, so we look at that chat room every day and we look at what's being posted by the NHSE team um, that has set that up. It's a myriad of data, to be honest with you, that's in there. Some of it's useful and some of it isn't. Um, so it does take a lot of time to go through it. So where we've been able to, we have actually gone in and tried to look. Um, uh, we're not as closely as connected as I like with the national team, to be honest with you, but the national modeling has been done at a slight, um, it feels like it's been done at a bit of a distance from us. And we'd like to be you know, closer to people on that, but we understand that you know, everyone's trying to do yeah. You know trying to do their bit and it's very busy um so uh, yes but um if you've got any any suggestions about what nhsx might be doing and that would be helpful then please feel free to highlight those because it may be that we've missed something will do thank you amy who is next on the um, um so the question from question. stephen blackburn uh, what is the difference between east and west kent in terms of population demographic etc um, well, that's a really interesting. I mean, East Kent's bigger. 
um, about 600,000 in West Kent versus 650 in East Kent. East Kent does have a, um, a higher level of deprivation than West Kent. Um, so we've just recently updated the modelling to put another layer of um, another layer of risk in, which reflects some of that deprivation difference. And it has made it has made a difference. And we've seen East Kent East Kent's lines come up and West Kent's going to go down in terms of demand, which which feels appropriate and right. So that's one of the improvements that we've made. Um, there is a, a there's a there's a we think, and I need to check this out, but it's an assumption we're going after and looking at today, that's a higher number of care homes in East Kent, um, which undoubtedly will have its, its impact. Um, on the, um, but I'm also hearing that we've had a greater number of deaths in West Kent in the care homes than we have in East Kent. So all these dynamics are all playing out and we're just trying to get on, on top of those. Um, but there, there is a difference between the two. Um, Mark, you're a West, you're an East Kent person, so you might want to comment. Yeah, I've just put a couple of things in the chat. East Kent's quite varied because Margate has got some of the most deprived wards in the country. Uh, Canterbury's massive student population, and Ashfield is a fast-growing town. But I, I didn't, I'd endorse everything you've said. I think the last five or ten years, you've seen quite a population movement out of London. So there would have been a traditional kind of labour fringe where white working class people would retire to Margate and Ramsgate but that's become quite mixed through the last five or ten years with a lot of different ethnicities moving down into the um the sort of medway towns and 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 some further down uh, into East Kent as well so it's a fairly deprived area and I think that point about national data is quite interesting because a lot of the stuff that Sarah's digging at is kind of local qualitative data on top of quantitative data you know right down at the level of this care home has got staff that have a very low proportion of people that speak English in it, you know, so we're a bit worried about that. Now, national data is just not, it's never set out to, and it's never going to capture the, the subtlety of some of the stuff we're looking at. It's like having an, an, you know, a national epidemiological model and then a local one informed by what we know about the care homes. You, you do sort of need both, and I can see why the centre need the national one to plan, but it's, it's not always of loads of use. Um, I think what we rely on is lots of, Sarah and I have a daily call at 10 with some other people and, and, and just sort of chew the fat on, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Um, are we worried about infection control? The sort of nosocomial infections that are going on at the moment, people catching COVID within a hospital and the national data is, is always going to be slightly behind some of that, but you need it as the, the grounding for the model. Um, and yeah. the other thing is, um, I think there's a, um, if I stereotype Kent for a minute, um, on West Kent, you've probably got a, a, a wealthier, pushier population who demand a lot of their health services. Um, in East Kent, you've got, um, and particularly in the poorer areas, you've got a tendency to present late. Um, and I think there is something in here about the fact that we are seeing people come in too late into some of the hospitals to be helped. Um, and, you know, that's something we've got to start taking very seriously because we need to make sure that we've got the proper interventions in the community um, to capture those people who might be resisting coming in. Great stuff. OK, thanks. I've, I've put the uh, geolytics care homes um, data into the chat. So if you want to have a look Great, at that, thank you. We'll, we'll put it on the, um, uh, the website as well as a resource. So if I share my screen again. That's the geolytics um, data, and you can download a CSV of all that data. So um, that's some great work that they've done. Uh, they used to be a, uh, uh, they used to use our co-working space at ODI Leeds, so they're, they're a friend of ours, so that's great. Uh, okay, so next up, uh, Duncan from OS, um, and then we've got Karen next. So Duncan, if you can come off mute. Yes, good, good morning and everybody. Can you, can you and hear Share me? your screen, over to you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me, Paul? Yeah, everyone can hear you. Yeah, that's great. So good morning, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. So please bear with me a second. Um, it's disabled at the moment, Paul. It says I can't share while somebody else is sharing. So yeah, I've just stopped, I've just stopped sharing. That? Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. So just so you know, Duncan, you've got five minutes. 
Thank you. I'll be very brief then. So can you see that? Uh, okay, everybody. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, first thing I wanted to say then is just something on um, uh, the emergency data license that we've prepared. So, uh, so whether data is open or not, uh, we have prepared a license that allows uh, all OS data to be used, shared effectively across, across government and the public sector in response to uh, COVID-19. So please uh, do have a look at that if you're not familiar with it. There's the URL on the bottom. We can make these slides available as a PDF afterwards uh, for those that want to follow that up. Um, I'd also like to thank Royal Mail and Pointex as well for their support in making um, things like addressing and uh, points of interest available through that emergency uh, data use license. Um, just a quick reminder on OS Open Data, so there's lots of that available already. There's about um, 14 products already out there. Um, shout out to things like Cope on Open, OS Open Zoom Stack, OS Open Names, and, and some of that is now available in, in easier plug and play format, uh, formats such as GeoPackage and, and GeoTIFFs. Um, there's more open OS data uh, coming, um, so that's coming um, in the, the middle part of this year. Um, so if those of you that been following events, uh, we'll be familiar with the uh, public sector geospatial agreement that's been recently signed, and therefore we're going to see four new open data sets coming uh, in July. Uh, <clears throat> OS Open UPRNs, uh, OS Open USRNs, OS Open Toys, and the OS Open uh, Linked Identifiers are all on the way. <clears throat> I just want to talk about the new OS uh, Data Hub that's in beta at the moment, which is going live from the 1st of July. Um, so that'll, you'll be able to download all of the existing and the new OS open data from there. It uses download links, so there's no need to give any personal details when you're down, making the download, so it's kind of more open than, than ever. Um, there's also going to be unlimited use of a free uh, OS open data APIs from the 1st of July. You'll of course need to register that, but that will give you uh, full access to an uh, open mapping API for, for GB. Touching on some of the other resources, uh, Geodata Viz. I don't know if uh, anybody's familiar with um, some of the really useful toolkits that my colleagues, uh, Paul Naylor and Charlie Glynn, have been working on. But if you're not, there's the blog, um, there's the repo on, on GitHub where you can download the toolkits. Um, really, really useful uh, resources to use data uh, more effectively. Um, so it's been around for a little while, but please have a look if you're not familiar with it. Um, also wanted to give a shout out to things like the uh, Civil Protection Common Map Symbology. So this has been around and since about 2012, but actually it, it is underutilized and we're, we're keen to just uh, make people aware of it. It's really designed for situations uh, like the one we face just now. It links through to the um, lexicon of UK uh, Civil Protection terminology. Um, we uh, developed symbols of conjectural cabinet office, emergency planning college, uh, and JSIP, so you can download all of these um, from the OS Mapping for Emergencies web pages. Uh, symbols available in SVG, BMP, and PNG. And you can see there on screen, you know, things like tactical coordination centers, emergency mortuaries, hospitals, all the symbols are there to, to do that. So uh, please, please feel free to take advantage of that. In terms of some of the work we've been doing in um, response to uh, COVID-19, we've had over 100 uh, requests for sort of a tailored support. Um, some of those have been just in the form of, you know, uh, producing maps that could be used in, uh, you know, in things like uh, strategic coordination groups, tactical coordination groups, command centers, um, just having visuals there that could be printed, uh, placed on walls, etc. A lot of it has been around geocoding, so we've been taking data from third parties, adding in coordinates, uh, you know, correcting the address, improving the address, and also adding the um, important UPRNs and, and USRNs where that's where that's relevant. So you see an example there on screen of community hubs down in the Hampshire uh, area. Um, also getting access to data. Um, so we've had lots of requests for data in, in particular formats or perhaps particular cuts of data. Um, so we've um, extended the normal range of formats and we pre-processed uh, all of our data now, be it open or proprietary, in, uh, into GeoPackage, PostGIS Dump, Esri File Geodatabase, and GeoTIFF. Uh, we've also cut that data to um, geographies um, such as local resilience forum areas of coverage. Uh, so for example, you can come now and get a full LRF set of data uh, inside a single geo package. And if anybody needs access to that service, uh, please let us know and we can provide that, uh, provide that access uh, to you. 
also running some data queries. So some people have asked for, you know, open data sets of national data sets of buildings to help with visualization, to help with uh, sort of monitoring where they're making interventions. So you see an example of that there uh, on screen and things like querying out where a, a supermarkets that have got car parks, uh, example here from NHS Lothian, uh, where they're um, wanting to know where there's potential car parts they can use for things like mobile phlebotomy uh, units. Um, so that's been really helpful. Um, we've all seen in the news about things like attacks on mobile phone mass, uh, particularly the 5G one. So again, we've asked to run queries of extracting uh, data sets of where the phone mass uh, are. And I'd just also like to give a shout out to a really interesting initiative, I don't know if anybody's picked this up, called Corona Friend Initiative, um, which has gone in, it's, it's a web-based app, uh, the URL is coronafriend.com, you see it there on screen. Um, so it's gone from my initial idea to launch in, in about two weeks, uh, nice easy search, map interface, postcode search, um, using OS Open Data, such as OS Open Data Zoom Stack, um, OS Open Roads. Um, generates your leaflet that you can drop through uh, your neighbor's letterbox is offering help. A really nice responsive design, works across all devices. Uh, I'd just like to give a shout out to the guys that created it because they're friends of ours that have come through um, the, the Geovation Hub and the Geovation program. So that's really great. And we'll be uh, publishing a blog on that uh, from OS uh, very soon. So please do take a look at that. And then finally, um, just want to mention the mapping for emergencies service. This is how you get in touch with us 24-7, um, 365 if you, if you need help in an emergency. Uh, there's the number on screen. Uh, there's the URL where you can get more information on our website. So, you know, if you have got an emergency, you need our help uh, with any of the kind of things that I've talked about in this session now, then please do uh, get in touch with us. We've been getting the message out there through things like our blogs, our social media. Um, my colleague Chris Chambers was on, on BBC News yesterday. Some of you might have seen that as well. I'm just talking about what we're doing. So getting that message out there, both um, at the sort of high level, but also targeted to uh, the communities that we know that sort of need our help, such as uh, Resilience Fora, the three NHSs, Emergency Services, UK devolved governments, UK military. So uh, please feel free to spread that message. And if you want to find out more about what we're doing, please visit this address here, os.uk slash about slash COVID-19. And there's a lot more information there. Happy to take any questions. Quick canter through, sorry for the pace, but hopefully Paul, that got us within the five minutes you were looking for. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And I think there's, um, there's some great resources there that people can use. Um, I'm just, uh, if people have got any questions about the chat, I think there might be some um, comments about UPRN matching and, and also the, um, I think there's a, a massive demand for that to be um, on the 1st of May rather than the 1st of July. So um, um, I'm, I'm aware, I'm, hopefully you can beat that target that you got for releasing the UPRN data. Um, so are, are there any questions before we move on? No, well, great. What we um, there's a, a, a basically a request from uh, ODI leads. If we can, we'll put those slides up on our. Uh, if you could send them through, we'll put them on the resources for the um, Open Data Socialize webpage. And then also, if there are specific blogs or um, examples of the work you're already doing, I think it'd be really great to put them on our webpage as well. And we've also got a, um, a whole load of explanations and explainers about how geography works and it's always more complicated than that and if there are data cut at um, NHS geographies um, which I think a lot of people were looking for um, at the start that would be amazing as well so maybe there's a couple of follow-ups we can do together. Great thanks Paul I'll send the slides through right now. Fantastic fantastic so next up uh, Karen Hodgson are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I don't have any slides or anything. I'm just going to talk. So, um, yes. Fantastic. Over to you. Um, so, I'm Karen Hodgson. I work in the data analytics team um, at the House Foundation. And we've been doing some work around how we can kind of support local analysts within health and care um, during COVID. Um, and I've been focusing on how we can help people to kind of work more collaboratively and share what they're doing. Um, so I'm going to put a couple of links in the chat, but as part of this, um, I've um, created kind of quite a rough and ready GitHub repository, which just has links to resources that people might find useful. 
So if anyone has anything they'd like to add to it, but also if anyone has any requests. So I thought what, what people were talking about earlier about that mobility data is really interesting. And it sounds like there's a data gap there in terms of access to things outside of big city. So, you know, let us know what you're missing and, you know, we can see whether we can find it for you. Um, or at least, you know, kind of share that information with other analysts. So if someone else has found it, we can kind of learn from that. Um, so we've been doing that, but I think one of the big problems we've come across is just people don't really know how to share. Um, at the Health Foundation, we've kind of been trying to move towards this kind of more transparent culture, both in our own work, but encouraging the people we work with too. But often it's not really there. So um, I wrote, I'm just trying to link while I talk, um, I wrote a brief blog, um, which I'm adding to the chat now, um, where we just try to give some kind of really simple intro guidance for people who've never worked openly before about how to do it. Um, just things like think about file formats, um, you know, th those sorts of things. And I think one of the biggest barriers we've come across is analysts. If you're not in a culture that's used to working openly, they don't have an online home for sharing their work um, and things are kind of being shared via email or they're being posted as sort of single snapshots of the current version um, onto things like the, the future NHS platform and I think that's quite dangerous right now when things are moving really quickly so we're sort of trying to think about how we can help people to share more openly but at the same time not kind of expect them to completely change their culture right now which is obviously kind of a bit um, a bit much to expect. Um, so I think we've got two pieces. One is around how we can help people to work more openly. Um, and the other is kind of really selling to people why they should be working more openly. And we've had some conversations with um, ODI leads about this. And I think, you know, there's been some kind of interest um, in sort of thinking about use cases and really demonstrating the value of working openly and the dangers of not doing it. Um, so yeah, um, I think anyone has any resources they want to share resources they'd love to see um, or any feedback on things that you found difficult or easy in terms of working openly we'd be really keen to kind of hear about that and think about whether we can help you um, do this better and support you in convincing other people to do it better as well um, so yeah um, I'll keep it brief thanks Karen that was amazing and then I think the um, massive um, culture change that we're seeing in people being more willing to share people asking where the data is um, and then realizing that the data is not easy to access and that people don't just have it in a in a bag under a desk that they can um, deliver by post to somebody um, um, is 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 going to be really interesting and um, the crisis has accelerated a lot of the work that we've been um, talking about for a long time so um, Hashtag radically open um, is um, something that we're doing, and I think also the 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 culture of do some work, write a report, publish that report, um, which takes two years to do usually, you know, has to be uh, challenged where it should be. Um, find the data that answers the question, publish that data, um, publish your um, thoughts about that, but then also encourage other people to make their own comments and use your work to 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 move forward past, um, at pace. And I think that's the real thing that we can see is that how do we create the data infrastructure that allows people to work at pace and answer the questions that we didn't know we had um, yesterday that we do have today. So thanks so much. And Callum, we'll put all those links onto the, um, I'm just getting a call through, but yeah, I'll put um, all those uh, links onto the, the Open Data Says Lives webpage and we'll link to your GitHub repo and vice versa. And I think that's, um, uh, huge yeah, help the, uh, for every, everyone. The link, the link to that uh, GitHub repository should be on our data page now. Okay, great stuff. Live, live updates. Fantastic. We love it. So, next is Dominic Campbell, FutureGov. Um, you've got a um, something I'm really interested in. So over to you, Dom. I'll stop sharing and over to you. Uh, like, hopefully this will work. Is that working? Yes, you're on. Perfect. 
Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I'll go do a very rapid canter through some work that we've been doing in the last six weeks in Camden in wider local government. I share the sentiment of a lot of you of feeling exhausted um, uh, having worked 24-7 for that period of time. But uh, it's quite nice to take a break and reflect on it to some degree and try and make sense of what we've been doing. Um, essentially, we... Uh, I had a conversation with the chief exec and leader of Camden just the week before Boris said that we were three weeks away from Italy in London. And at that point, we decided to do a collection of parallel Google sprints, essentially, to try and design new ways of responding to the food, food crisis, to the impending childcare education crisis, um, to getting people out of hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not knowing uh, that Boris was then going to accelerate things the week after, uh, at which point we landed, instead of five people, we landed 25 people into Camden to support them, uh, basically under the auspices of the chief exec saying um, the gold response and the classic top-down response that public sector jumps to in these situations is great. It's great in terms of uh, ensuring core service delivery. It's great ensuring that the core council services remain in place. But what we want to be able to do is look back from this crisis and say not just that we did the least that we could, but actually that we did everything we possibly could uh, to respond um, in a sort of no regrets way. So we were there to, to sort of give them some extra capacity to sort of think long and act, act short in, in the crisis, which is quite difficult when you're doing, uh, you're doing your your day job and flipping it overnight to support a crisis response. Um, and from the very beginning, Camden were keen that everything that they did was open, uh, that it was as collaborative and collegiate as possible, that um, it was essentially a, that they could act as the sort of beginning of a community to bring together all of the great work from other councils, health sector and elsewhere, as, and, and sort of lead by example of doing that within, within Camden as well. So we, um, we sort of started a Camden supported coalition, um, one that um, uh, looked at sort of bringing together this partnership of um, organisations who were responding and bring together all of their, their sort of inventions, whether it's code or new service designs, uh, how people are putting together food services where they might be supporting food banks, uh, new, new approaches to childcare. But on the other hand as well, code, uh, data and a whole range of other things as well. So we started to sort of from the very beginning think about how can we act local but think national and bring people together to share as best as possible. Um, so you can see, see a lot of that on coronaviruslocalresponse.co.uk um, which includes links to GitHub and other things from the work that we've been doing. Their principles from the very beginning were to go beyond the basics essentially um, how do we how do we lock in the essentials, but at the same time, reach out and make best use of all of the resources within Camden and think long term immediately? Um, and they were very quick off the blocks to see this as a chance to build on the work they'd already been doing in terms of neighbourhood work, in terms of uh, they were strong on climate assemblies and participatory democracy. So how could they build on that trust and that way of working within the borough to be able to? do the most that they could during this, pro this period of crisis. Um, this diagram has um, sort of persisted through the work, which I think is quite a nice way to think about how the work has been structured really. So there was this vulnerable people's list, which to be honest has been a bit of a shit show from a local government perspective. Um, the first list that we were given was 115 people total. For a London borough, uh, obviously not 115 people who are vulnerable in Camden. We were expecting closer to five to 10,000. Um, uh, but then alongside that, thinking about who does the council already know on their systems? How can we draw that complete data set together as quickly as possible to start to reach out, design services for a range, a range of people? But then importantly, as I say, this black circle around the outside as well in terms of thinking ahead to who are going to be the newly vulnerable, the people who don't know public services, the ones who are Uber drivers or more, who we might need to uh, support uh, through this crisis as they start to drop into vulnerability, started building different future, uh, future service design, 
have started to think about both what is the core service design of, of sort of resilience across all, a range of services, but also how this might be the future operating model of the council. Very much thinking about council as a platform for community action. How can they open themselves up and reinvent their operating model in a very full stack way, thinking about service and organization and technology. So in many ways, it's a proto transformation program as well as a crisis response. Uh, thinking across this octagon of services from food support, financial support, shelter, domestic abuse, childcare, medical, et cetera, et cetera, with this sort of shield response in the middle of, of food and medical response. But they're thinking about from the very beginning, what's coming next, what new services do we need, and how do we best orchestrate this whole range of interventions. That led to a piece of technology strategy work, essentially, and, and delivery which is around like what tools do we need in order to support people, things like the directory of services, um, you know, web forms integrate that are integrated both with an ability to apply for support, but equally that interrogate the directory in a more tailored way to say, we know what your needs are and where you live. So here's seven community services you might want to see. And then a whole range of technology around it that we've either been building, borrowing from places like Hackney, um, and their GitHub where we've been doing work as well, uh, and places like Surrey where Lantern was conceived in the first place. Um, yeah, this was the directory of services. It essentially built on the Buckinghamshire um, Family Information Service directory that we happened to build this since Christmas, that we then ported the code across and got this live within three days and then gave a copy back to Buckinghamshire uh, in order that they could have it as well. And then it built this sort of ecosystem kind of modelled on Deliveroo in some respects, which is thinking about how do you understand needs through the Beacon tool? How do you orchestrate the workforce through a thing called Sing Signal, which is delegated tasks to volunteers and frontline workers? Uh, and then how do you, you build on the shared plan, which came from Hackney, which is giving vulnerable people a view of what uh, services they're going to receive from whom and when. Some of this is in mature stage. So Beacon is essentially a, a fully fledged sort of needs-based CRM that we've built and implemented um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, which will be up on GitHub next week for others to adopt should they wish. And you'll find that on the local response website, um, which gives you this single view of needs across the borough. There's three and a half thousand people who have their needs being triaged and met through this right now in Camden. Uh, it's popular and much more popular than the spreadsheets, which is where it started. Um, and now we're moving into prototyping Signal as the uh, volunteer organization and workforce organization tool. Um, so that was just to give you a quick canter through where we've got to um, get in touch by all means. We're looking for councils, health sector, anybody who's got things to contribute to list those on the website. Uh, and if you want to be part of a sort of wider collaborative of people who are thinking about both crisis response and recovery and the types of data and technology tools, as well as service designs that we might want to put in place, then, um, then get in touch and join, join the gang, basically. Amazing. Thanks, Dom. Um, another fellow traveller on this um, and the locally relevant Get Things Done share wildly is um, an amazing uh, example for us all. So, um, Dom, how do people get involved? How do people get in touch? What's the way that they can join in? Uh, I'll post my email address and the, and the URL in the chat and i um, happy to chat to anyone anytime. If, if you want to, uh, we tend to see ourselves a bit like ODI leads as a sort of insider outsiders of the sector. But if you want to talk to, to true insiders with gov.uk email addresses, I can hook you up with people in Camden and, and elsewhere as well. So, um, but yeah. Happy to, happy to have anybody in the club. Fantastic. And then we'll put all, um, we'll get the links as well, put it on the Open Data Saves Lives webpage and um, maybe get um, 100 words from you that explains what it is. And are you happy for those slides to be shared as well? Yeah, I'll give a slightly edited version for you to share, but yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Great stuff. Um, if you've got any questions for Dom, stick them in the chat. He'll put his uh, contact details in there as well and the links. Um, so yeah, that's a, an amazing ex, um, example of how we can work at pace to respond. And also, um, I know on previous chats, we've talked about how data can be used to respond to all of the other challenges that COVID has, has uh, brought up. So 
domestic abuse, um, who is vulnerable and who, just because you're on a list doesn't mean you are the only person who's vulnerable in your street. So there's a whole load of um, real issues that we need to deal with and help people do that. And, the, and I think we're, we're all finding that the old way of doing things and procuring things is not what's going to be the best way to respond. So uh, that's fantastic. Thanks very much, Don. Last but not least, um, we have Graham Hyde. Uh, can you hear us, Graham? Yep, I'm here. Great stuff. So if you want to crack on, and then um, I'll hand over to you. Okie dokie. Uh, I've just got a couple of slides to show you and talk through. Hopefully you can see some. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yes, okay, can. so uh, so I work in Leeds. Um, I work between Leeds City Council and the CCG. Um, and initially, when all this uh, kicked off, I was feeling a bit, uh, didn't know where my role fitted in, couldn't see myself having a bit of a purpose. So I went out and, and found something to do. Um, and that thing was around the shielded uh, cohort um, uh, data sets that were being provided. Um, to, to Lee City Council. So um, kind of building on what the previous speaker said, um, the, the, that shielded cohort, um, I guess it is what it is. And actually we've, we've kind of rebuilt it um, within the CCG uh, using primary care records and, uh, and medical input. So what we were trying to do with this little project is if you can see that kind of leaky pipe, um, We've got a load of people that we need to do something with but at each stage in that process some people fall through the through the plumbing but we need to make sure we don't basically we need to reduce the number of people that, that fall out of the plumbing so we need to really link data sets together and to know whether or not folk are in touch with um, statutory services and they can get in touch with them um, I mean, that, that slide just shows there's, there's all sorts of touch points with people in Leeds. There's a massive third sector um, effort, which is, which is pretty mind blowing. Um, so really, the, the, the aim of this little project was to provide um, some intelligence back to the council and statutory services um, around the people that were shielding. And then every day um, we have a new file, which has grown by about 600 percent in a month. Um, so you might know that if you're on the shielded uh, list, you get sent a letter by uh, the government uh, pointing you to support, to self-register on a website as clinically extremely vulnerable. And there's a number of questions on there that asks basically, can you uh, carry your shopping over the threshold? Can you do shopping? Um, have you got support for basic needs? So when that data comes in every day, there's an immediate kind of triage and response from the city council. Um, and those people are contacted. Um, but we also wanted to, again, try and reduce the number of people falling through the leaky pipe. Um, and there was the idea to link some data sets together. So the, the two, the, the shielded cohort and the daily file has an NHS number. This is all, um, this is all personally identifiable information. So it's, uh, it's, it needs to be handled sensitively. Um, we also want to avoid duplication of, of efforts and contact if we can uh, within Leeds. Um, so we know that adult social care within Leeds City Council has an NHS number, so that's linkable, but housing don't. So housing work on a UPRN. So from uh, previous lives working in local uh, authorities, I was aware of the UPRN and friends at the Ordnance Survey. And really just engage the local um, random property gazetteer team at Leeds City Council. If I was to send them some addresses, they would be able to match a UPR and back. I could add that to my data and then link really nicely, really simply um, between data sets to say all these people are known to housing, they are council house tenants uh, or they're in sheltered accommodation or care homes and just enable them that, that link across data sets and we would be able to enact some support to those people. Um, so there's a little in-house process um, to match UPRNs to addresses. 
if anyone has ever tried to match addresses and postcodes from one data set to another, it's a nightmare. Um, but essentially this UPRN, and, I, and I'll bang on about this until I retire, um, the UPRN is the thing that really needs to be in all data sets, in all government data sets um, within the health environment. It would be fantastic if that could be on the spine or somewhere that we could then do that linkage across uh, on the UPRN. And that also allows us then to present data back to, um, we've got various levels of command, gold, silver and bronze in this. I hate the word dashboard and I tried to get out of it, but it didn't happen. Um, so we present basically the position from the shielded list and the number of people that we know that we've contacted. Um, this particular um, representation here is really interesting and it has caused some real interest in that if you split that data or shielded data, those that have been identified and those that have been confirmed as registered, there is a huge number, you know, double the number of people identified in the poorest areas of Leeds and actually kind of less than half have actually put their hands up and said, yes, we've received that letter and yes, yes or no, we need some support. So there's some real work to do and that, that kind of defines what those third sector organisations and leads who know about those people, that they, it, it influences their response. Um, and and Leeds City Council has a, has a strap line around um, improving the health of the poorest people fastest. And actually this slide, I think for me, really kind of grabs that attention. Um, just because I'm a geography geek, I've then able to um, aggregate this data up to ward or what we call local care partnerships or PCNs in Leeds. And actually then the data will inform those kind of local hubs. Where do we need to um, engage with the population more? Um, because there are a lot of people who are identified as shielding in particular areas, but actually um, they haven't confirmed that they've received that letter. So there's all sorts of other kind of bits of um, geography that we can uh, aggregate this stuff to, and that informs the response within leads. Um, so that's just very brief. I know we've, uh, we've run over time, but that's, that's what we've been doing in Leeds. Um, if anyone's, anyone's interested, um, please get in touch. And this will also then, kind of the future thinking, which is in a, a meeting this afternoon is around. We're also, we're already doing um, population health management in Leeds. We've already got a linked data set, but it's pseudonymized. How do we use the work that the CCG has done with their shielded list that has used medical input? How do we use that going forward in Leeds to look at risk and uh, how we approach and proactively manage people in Leeds? And that's all I've got to say. Thanks so much, Graham. Um, we talked about UPRNs there. Um, would, is, is OS um, publishing their UPRNs going to help you? Could you do them next week? Or, or is it a, um, uh, what, 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 could we, what can we do the quickest to help you around your challenge around UPRN? It's that address matching. So if you've got a, if you've got a, a record with an address and a postcode, um, it, it's then having the UPRN appended. If, it, if that could be appended at source, and you didn't have to share the address and postcode, you just share the UPRN. It's that unique number to unique number. It just makes life easier. So at the moment, we've got an, we've got a, an address database of I don't know, 10,000 folk that we have to then send away to the, the Gazetteer team and they automate uh, some of the matching. But as I said before, matching addresses and postcodes is horrific at the best of times. Um, but if this stuff was at source, it would make everyone's life easier. Fantastic. So I think there's a definite use case there and there's a definite workflow. Um, probably doesn't need to be wrapped up in a geospatial commission to, to make that work. Um, so good stuff. Thanks very much, Graham. Um, okay. We've overrun a little bit because we've had a packed agenda, but there's so much um, positive um, outputs there and so much convening and connecting that we, we're doing already, which is, which is amazing. Um, Jessica has just jumped off from NHS Digital and she's posted the, the dashboards from uh, Goldman Sachs that have been in there. So who'd have thought it? Goldman Sachs are producing dashboards for um, NHS Digital. Let's all have a look at that. I'm sure they're amazing. Um, but let's, let's check on that.
Um, we're going to be um, hosting this again next week. We've already got some people who are uh, want to join in um, and present their work. Um, we're having conversations with a lot of people about what you do next. So please do um, join in, share, and, and collaborate. <clears throat> it's quite interesting how the way in which um, Open Data Sales Labs moved is from ODLE sharing what it's been doing to allowing other people to share what they're doing. We'll, we'll, we'll collate all this and, and put it all in one place. And then I think um, what we will be doing is we've, we've put out a questionnaire to people about um, how they're finding these. Um, and then also, if we could have some input from everyone about what we do next um, and how we, we maintain the uh, momentum around Open Data Saves Lives. Obviously, we don't own this. Uh, we're helping it happen. So if people want to run their own Open Data Saves Lives work, if they want to collaborate slightly differently, do their own thing, but um, connect, um, that's absolutely how we want this to, to progress. So I'm, I'm going to finish up there because we've gone over my um, uh, hour uh, that I try and, uh, try and keep underneath. But we will be doing it next week. We will be continuing to, to um, maintain the communications with everybody. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing you all next week. Thanks very much. If the LDLE team could just uh, keep on, we'll do a couple of five minutes.